Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Hey, thank you so much for joining us here on our YouTube channel for episode number 999, everybody. This is the last three-digit episode in the history of the Off Farm Income Podcast. Hey, it is great to have you here on our YouTube channel. And, uh, man, we are really excited to profile a new and uh, very timely business in agriculture for you today. We're going to be speaking with Kevin Johansson about his app and website called Ag Butler that seeks to match up people in agriculture who need labor during peak times with people who are looking to go to work in agriculture during peak times. And it is so timely because it's just one week after we had Ben Reichert on the show talking about working internationally and taking different ag jobs around both the United States and in other countries. And along comes an app that can help match people up. Really exciting. And we're going to get that started for you right now. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on today. Matt, I appreciate you having us on. I'm looking forward to having the conversation today. Well, you know, it's great. This I think this is the very first time. I'm trying to think back. Uh, you're episode 999, so I've got a lot of episodes to think back on here, but I believe this is the first time that the spouse of another guest has come on to profile their agricultural business. So uh, really cool that uh, both you and Jamie are so involved, not just in ag, but in entrepreneurship as well. That's that's a neat deal. Yeah, we, uh, we're we very much entrepreneurial minded, and uh, we, we like to put almost too many irons in the fire, but <laughs> We, we we enjoy staying busy. Yeah, that is the curse of the entrepreneur is uh, once you get started, there's a million good ideas out there. It's hard to hold yourself back from pursuing all of them. That is that is very true. <laughs> now, we also we we do have the the cut gate that says we we can't tackle this. And uh -huh. so <laughs> that those group ideas do get cold out. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's do this. Let's get a little background on you. Where are you talking to us from today? So we are in Lebanon, Missouri. It's a balmy six above zero. <laughs> and so uh, we, we are in Laclede County here in Missouri. Um, we actually are operating on Jamie's grandparents' century farm uh, where we do hay and uh, run seed stock, Charlay and Hereford cattle and the Hereford cattle. I think it was on that episode, Jamie talked about Hereford cattle mm -hmm. where her background and Charlay was my background. Okay, got it. So six above today. I uh, actually just finished an interview a few minutes ago with a young man from Nebraska. His high today was uh, three below. So if those temperatures are moving from west to east, it's going to get worse for you. Yeah. Uh, this morning when I was doing chores, the truck showed negative 14. And so I'm glad we got some sunshine to at least swing the pendulum to the positive yeah no kidding my goodness pretty unprecedented um that that was a high school student i was talking to so he's only been on this earth 15 years but you've been here a little bit longer you ever seen it this bad it has been a while as far as cold um polar vortex year was probably the last time it was extended amount of temperature but um, and, and that was when we were here in Southern Missouri the first time. And it was, it was cold enough that it shut down all of our diesel motors and we had one gas feed truck that fed, hmm. fed everything. So it made for a long day. Yeah. Uh, we got through it. And what about this time? Are you able to get the diesels going? Yeah. Uh, our, our truck that we have has been running solid and it hasn't went down on us yet. And I kind of crossed my fingers this morning with it being negative 14. <laughs> yeah. Like, Please fire so we can <laughs> get going on the day. And so it did. But um, all we have to really contend with is thawing out some water lines here and there. Okay. Okay. So to profile what life looks like for you and Jamie, and in the intro, I kind of talked about my previous interview with her a little bit. Uh, but the two of you are there on that farm. You're raising cattle. Um, hay as well. Did I get that part right? Yes. Okay. And um, then your your both of you, your forms of off farm income are they are they exclusively coming from small businesses and entrepreneurship, or is there a job mixed in there somewhere as well? Um, on my side, there is a, a job mixed in there. So I'm a during the day I'm a regional sales manager 
for a electrical distribution company. And okay. so a lot of, a lot of people in agriculture, we service a lot of the electric co-ops, um, in the country. And so, um, on your dust to dawn light, if you have a meter socket or, um, a socket breaker unit that is powering your outbuildings. If uh, you look on the front end, it has Stamp Durham Company. Mm -hmm. That is who I work for. Okay, got it. And if any of your listeners have another brand, they need to switch to our brand. They're left to co-op to do so. <laughs> All right, yeah. Throw out a little, uh, little. Uh, I don't know. What do you call that? A little advocacy for your uh, for your company there. Good, good, good. How did you get involved in doing that? Well, we were. Um, Look, I was actually working for Missouri Cattlemen's Association as a manager of membership. And we were looking at trying to come back to this area because we enjoyed the Lebanon area. <clears throat> and like I mentioned, Jamie had family here. And uh, part of her family knew that they were looking for a regional sales manager. And so we made that transition to where we could uh, help out managing the farm here as well as uh, taking a day job to help fund the mm -hmm. farming operation. Sure, sure. And you grew up in agriculture, is that right? Your dad, you, we were talking off the air, your dad's still raising cattle? Yes, so I grew up in Tipton, Missouri, which is central Missouri. It's right smack dab in the center of the state. And where Tipton is located is right on the border of when the row crop land kind of starts transitioning into the Ozark Hills mm -hmm. and more into the grass and rocks where we're at. And so um, I grew up on a row crop and cattle operation. And my mom and dad still live on where, the place where I grew up. My cousins do the row cropping and dad has a spring has the spring herd of the Charlet division. Okay. Got it. Oh, very cool. Well, so we're here today to, to talk about, uh, one of your entrepreneurial ventures and that is ag Butler and, uh, which is a great title by the way, but, uh, go ahead and explain to us all what that is. So ag Butler is an on-demand labor app and we're connecting farmers and ranchers with part-time labor in their rural communities. Um, a lot of times farmers and ranchers have issues um, getting enough labor, especially in their peak season time. And so we're utilizing Ag Butler as a solution to alleviate those bottlenecks. Okay. When did you start this? Well, from uh, idea to now, we started um, kicking around the idea and getting feedback from friends and family in the industry fall of 2017 and then we took the long uh winding path of a startup company mm -hmm. and not just a startup company but a ag tech startup company and so um we in 2018 we made it official as an llc and then started um kind of putting our business plan together and mapping out how we were going to do that and then we partnered up with the National Center for Beef Excellence um, on helping us write a couple of grant applications. And and then we kind of worked on some demos and just basically laying our network down with our acquaintances in ag associations and organizations. Um, and we went that route because uh, that's where our target market is. And if you get validated by those groups, then it's an easy access point to get the information to those uh, customers and get the proper information to them to, um, you know, to utilize the platform to its fullest capacity. Okay. And so are we talking about an app, a website, both? What are we talking about? Actually, it's um, both. And whenever we got started, um, there was a couple of other players in the, in the space and they either had just a website or just an app. And so as we continued to build and try to work towards building the whole platform out, um, our developers that we worked with out of Kansas city, uh, Kakuru suite, they, they were able to map it out to where it 
mirrored all three platforms. So we ended up building it for Apple users, Android users, and for some of the people that we all know that still utilize uh, a non-smartphone, we okay. um, we set it up to where they could utilize it from a web-based or a desktop version. Okay. And we were able to build the platform out um, when we were able to secure a value-added grant from the Missouri um, Department of Ag and Small Business Authority about a year ago. Okay. And so that's where we really um, pushed our our business ahead is when we got that value-added grant that helped us build out the technology and fi- uh, fine-tune our business plan. And so with with that value-added grant, um, we would – we would still kind of be truly bootstrapping it. Okay. So. Okay. So for me to understand, you came up with the concept or, or you and Jamie came up with the concept of this, this app, this technology that I would assume began with, with recognizing the need in the marketplace for that. So how did you, how did you, I guess, figure out that this was needed? Well, during my college years and early adulthood years, I was basically a freelancer, um, went and would pack up clippers and go and get ready, cattle ready at national shows or get cattle clipped and ready for uh, production sales. And so um, being on the laborer side and more now we do more managing of tasks on multiple operations between my parents, her parents, and the place here in Lebanon, um, just trying to find those connections of people that are available within a close proximity of your operation. Or, um, you know, if you look at a typical environment within a five, 10 mile radius, everybody's doing the same thing. So if you could expand that out 20, 30 miles, maybe, maybe somebody's getting rain there but not at your place to Mm -hmm. where they could come and help on a a short notice and so it was more about developing a marketplace or a platform to where everybody can come to and have one source instead of um, you know while we were building this we saw on social media people posting hey do you know somebody that can help haul square bales do you know somebody that can haul three head of cattle to XYZ place. And so um, there for a while, my my photo album on my phone was more screenshots of people looking for, okay. for part-time help than anything. And so um, starting putting two and two together um, and listening to some other entrepreneurial podcast um, and connecting the dots is like, you know, there wasn't really anybody else trying to solve this problem. Mm-hmm make it more streamlined. Um, and so that's where we go off into this entrepreneurial adventure. Okay. So you saw the need, uh, and you worked and lived in the need, uh, as, as one of the people going out and providing those services and then realized there was nobody out there that was solving this problem of just this antiquated way of, of matching up people who needed help with people who were out there that that were for hire that, that would provide that help. Correct. And, you know, whenever we started getting into it um, and a lot of these competitions, so a whole nother deal that we got into was applying for ag tech competitions through those grassroots associations and organizations, like I mentioned, us building that network with. Mm -hmm. And then um, so that that challenged us to find other competitors that we could compare against and then there was some other ones that started to surface, but we were all about at the same starting point. And okay. then, you know, a few of them had actual developers on their founding team. So that helped them progress further, which none of us are developers. And mm-hmm. so we luckily found Kakuru that um, had that background that could really help us um, exponentially get everything built out. Okay. Well, that was going to be my next question. So you come up with this concept, you know how to deliver it, which is through an app, through a website, but then you don't have the, I don't the skill set or the knowledge to do that. 
So you've got to find somebody to build that for you. Um, without that grant, would you have been able to afford to, to pay this organization to build this for you? Um, we would have had to extend our line of credit that we uh, secured from the hometown bank. Um, and I'm going to give Tipton Latham Bank a shout out because that was the hometown bank that I know you talked to a lot of 4-H and FFA members uh -huh. on the platform. And that's where I got all my um, start in ag lending for my uh, county fair project, which was a market steer every year. And so we would actually go to a lot of our um, Charlie Bull customers and go through their calf crop and pick out uh, a Charlie cross steer from our bull customers. And so that's where I got started in the, in the line of credit world through Tipton Latham Bank. And so with that being a long standing relationship, I uh, posed the, um, you know, the, what we were working on and they saw value in it and trusted us enough to take a chance on us. And so in the beginning before, you know, when we started the LLC and did some demo work and some promotion, um, that was based all off of, uh, Tipton Latham bank, uh, taking a chance on us. Okay. So, and so you had that going on and had that grant not come through, then you would have been, you would have been using that line of credit to finance uh, the build out. Yes. Or, you know, diving off into the, uh, fundraising world, which okay. not every, uh, startup founder wants to do, uh, -huh. uh the, per the perfect world is you, you set up a platform and then you start generating revenue and you kind of work off that way. But, um, certain, certain startups need some additional investment, but yeah, um, going back to that, if, if we weren't able to secure that a value added grant, we would have had to have, uh, extend the line of credit or um, got back to um, the fundraising trail and okay. got some added investment. So was that grant something that you already knew about or did you at that point in, in the development of the business, did you go, I need to find something and start looking for grants and opportunities uh, to help pay for this development? Well, the, the grant route was um, given to us through our relationship with the national center for beef excellence okay. and so they're the ones that turned us on to the the grant versions and you know us being at this for almost three and a half years now um and being introduced to other people in the ag tech um industry there's a there's a plethora of avenues to go and potentially get fundraising through grants or um other investors that are focusing on ag tech, but, um, that's, that's how we, that's how we found the value added grant through MASBA. We knew about MASBA, but didn't know that this would be a route that we could actually take. Okay. So that happened, you got it developed. And then when was your launch date? So, um, the silver lining for 2020 for us was, um, uh, things kind of all shut down for everybody mm -hmm. and, and where it kind of helped us out. You know, I mentioned a few other competitors in this space were a little bit ahead of us, um, but our developers had some projects that got put on hold because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to focus more developers on our project, which sped up the development time. And so initially a year ago, we were told it'd be November before we could launch, and, and we were fine with that. And then once things kind of picked up, um, it was looking like we were able to, we were going to be potentially able to release this ahead of fall harvest, which mm -hmm. was going to be real beneficial. And so um, it was July, we did kind of beta testing with some select people that uh, we developed kind of a sell before you build list we okay. called it the first service and so it was a list where when we were talking to people they could sign up and we could keep them up to date on our progress and what we we're doing and where we we're going to be and things of that nature so we were able to utilize some of them to you know throw everything at the app to see if we could find any more bugs before we released it and so 
then then came the question when do we launch mm -hmm. and we want <laughs> then that was the big conundrum do we slowly roll it out or do we try to make a big deal about it and then the next thing out of my mind was let's do it at missouri state fair because at you know early july that was one of the only state fairs that was gonna have most everything there minus uh concerts and everything like that mm -hmm. and so we were set on doing it there because all the press would already be there and then uh, about two weeks after we decided to do that, then they reduced it just to mm. the junior kids, which was great because kids could finish out their projects right. for that year. And and so we decided we're just going to sit back, let the fair be focused on the kids. And we just kind of, and we waited until after the fair was over with. And so we basically launched at the end of August, the 1st of September, and um we allowed it for anybody um that knew about the platform could sign on and um and i guess i need to mention that you know to sign on as a laborer or an employer is is free to set up a profile um there's no cost to that at all so you can sign up and then navigate the app and get used to it and that was the reason why we went ahead and launched it in september instead of waiting and building a whole marketing campaign mm -hmm. to launch it at the first of the year, because still not knowing what the COVID situation was being, and it was starting to affect rural communities more. Um, we wanted the platform available in the event people needed help during a harvest or mm -hmm. any fall um, farm or ranch tasks. So it, it ended up being a good move to make. Um, we kind of rolled out a whole social media campaign to update and educate people on how to use the platform because, again, we were planning on having in-person events to, you know, educational events and show people in real time how to utilize it, and that kind of went away, so it was all virtual. And so it was it was really good because we were picking up a lot of new users month over month. Um, up until November, December, of course, it was kind of a slowdown, but um, it, it proved very beneficial to go ahead and just unwrap, unwrap the box and let it go to work. All right, Kevin. So now that we're back, so you you got this going. Uh, you released it in September uh, without the big fanfare and, and all of that, just kind of this gradual release so people could start using it. So what kind of response did you get? Did, did people start grasping onto this? Yeah, we we were pretty pleased with uh, the number of new users that were coming on. I mean, we were getting anywhere from twenty five to thirty new users a week, hmm. um, and and then we were hitting about a hundred users per month there for three three and a half months. Mm -hmm. And you know, before the break, I mentioned we had that little bit of slowdown during November December, which was understandable and we thought that would probably be uh the case with uh, holidays and everything coming up and um so we were pretty pleased with you know not having a big push but then also um validating our approach on working with grassroots organizations to get our get our information out to those members and having that stamp of approval from those ag association organization proved to be um a win for hmm. us okay so how are people finding out about it i mean that's that's a lot of people signing up how are people finding out if you weren't doing the whole marketing campaign and the launch and all of that well we i mean our basically what we utilized was our social media as our loan lane of promotion okay um, with our other co-promoters with the association organizations. But then we also gained a lot of traction whenever we were, um, when we competed in the Ag Innovation Challenge with American Farm Bureau. Okay. And, and the Ag Tech Challenge with Farm Credit Services of America. Um, that all happened a year ago. So, <clears throat> and, and in between those two was the value added grant um, presentation as well. So 
a year ago in January, we had three weeks of we were just running 90 to nothing, um, hmm. getting all that ready. Okay. So, Kevin, you, you did this launch and you were you were doing these competitions and that was kind of helping to get the word out. So, is, is your first subscribers, are they all mostly regional or have you been able to get more of a nationwide uh, net kind of cast out there? So, our plan for the rollout um, was initially to focus on Missouri and um, get that business plan set up and then just repopulate that as we moved out away from Missouri. And what we had found um, with all the traction that we got from the competitions and our social media uh, presence, uh, then you look at our founding team. And of course, my wife, Jamie, has been in ad communications and been all over the place. So uh, a lot of friends in the industry saw what we were doing. So we mm -hmm. got additional traction for there. So whenever we were focusing more on Missouri and the Midwest, it really expanded out because of the more of the light that got shined on what we were doing. And so I think the last time I checked our reports, I mean, we have people from about 28 states on the platform, mm -hmm. but the most of the population is centralized around Missouri, Iowa, Kansas, and Illinois. And okay. our plan is to, expand those populations and those outer lines just with our marketing campaign that we're rolling out at the first of this year okay to kind of focus more on those um broader states okay and it's an interesting thing to think about too you know the business owners and the operators who are looking for help who are tuned in they're they're involved in trade publications they're out there online and all of this i could see you know as i visualize this i can see them finding it but your your person who can do that that task, like haul three head of cattle to somewhere for them or something like that, how do those people find out about them? Are they just as interactive out on social media and in, in the in the world of agriculture as the as the business owners, the operators, farmers, and ranchers? Yeah, we you know most of the, most people that would jump on as far as hauling something, uh, you know, those three head of cattle to location. Uh, there's a lot of people. Um, out on our friends list as well. So not just the business page, but all of us involved with Ag Butler, um, we typically like and share all of our posts. So it, it goes to a whole nother spectrum. And, mm -hmm. you know, the people that have signed on and the first users that I talked about, um, we really send updated emails to that group and say, hey, we're rolling out this we'd appreciate if you know you help like and share all the promotional stuff that we get out there especially some of those uh users that are in states that have very few users that helps populate that to give them more opportunity to um, either secure a job or find high quality labor within a certain radius to their location okay very interesting now when it comes to this as a business as a form of off-farm income how does this type of business generate revenue for you? Well, the, the business model is set up for uh, Ag Butler to generate revenue. The main driver is the connection fee. And that's the only thing that costs uh, the users. And so um, there's a bunch of different ways that the ride sharing delivery service that they use. Um, we did not want to go that route of taking a percentage of what is paid to that uh, service provider mm -hmm. we basically set it up as a flat connection fee so whenever let's say matt you hire me for a job you would you would incur the connection fee because you found the laborer on the platform and then once the job's complete the transaction between you and the laborer is is between you now we do see down the road as we uh, evolve our platform, we could set up accounts for laborers to where they get paid direct into their account and they can withdraw it however they need to. Um, we just, we're just not there yet. We will be. Um, but you know, like we mentioned, it takes, uh, ag tech takes a lot of capital to get stuff mm -hmm. built out. And so that would be the next round. And then we also have uh, banner ads that we run through the platform to where, you know, if lacrosse or powder river wants to 
uh, <laughs> promote their products on our platform or anybody else. Um, and also we can see this as an avenue for, you know, uh, machinery sales or production sales and mm -hmm. all types of livestock. So that's going to be the other round. And then we also are going to, we have on our shelf an agribusiness um, portion to where agribusinesses can find uh, labor to help them out in their peak seasons. Okay. So what is that connection fee? The connection fee is $20. Okay. So it's $20 each time a, a company or a business farmer rancher, they hire one of these people. Uh, they pay you $20 for, for hooking them up. So I think this is a natural question for anybody out there listening who's got a similar idea, probably in another facet of agriculture, they're looking at doing something like this. How do you how do you avoid connecting these two people? Because obviously, I don't think anyone's going to hire anybody blank slate. They're going to want to communicate with them or see something about them. How do you avoid somebody doing a workaround and, and finding the person on your site, but then connecting with them outside the site um, and then avoiding paying you that $20 fee? Well, that has been a question from the get go and people asking us that workaround question and we, we know that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and the way we prepare for that is building enough value into the platform to where the labor is, you know, loyal to us and, or the employer, um, you know, a scenario comes up, say you hire me to come clip cattle. Um, and then you just continue to connect with me directly from there mm -hmm. on. But let's say you need a hoop barn built and you knew that you found good quality labor through Ag Butler. So might as well go back and see if I can find a, a crew on Ag Butler to f facilitate the construction part that you need. And so initially there's going to be some of those uh slip throughs but i think as we grow and evolve uh this marketplace um we can we can build enough value into it that uh, people can see that that there's a lot of value to come back and and find a bunch of information or uh, other service providers through the platform Okay. And when it comes to developing an app like this and, and a website and putting all this together, then with you outsourcing the development, how much of the day-to-day, -day, I, I guess, how many hours a day are you working on this? How much of the day-to-day -day, uh, work falls into your lap? Well, the nice thing that has happened whenever they built the app, they have a, a dashboard, an admin dashboard on the back end. And I basically check in on that quarterly through the day to make sure um, everything is running fine or if somebody sends an email and says they can't log in. A lot of the stuff that we can, we can access through that dashboard. And so they made it really simple, not just for uh, the users, but for us as admins to be able to fix most anything. Um, the other nice thing that we have on the labor side is um, you can find people by uh, star rating, location, and specifications. But then also we we inserted a spot where people want to take that extra step and supply references from their previous work in ag mm -hmm. um, and call and validate those, and they get an initial star rating, and then those individuals would have a badge on their profile that says ag butler approved and that just designates that they went that extra step to provide references to show that they are definitely in ag and know what they're doing okay so there is a rating system that both the employee and the employer can fill out uh after working with each other is that correct right now uh, the employer can rate the employee um, we are working to build in the rating back on the employer. Okay. Um, right now it's just a one-way rating, and pretty soon the it'll be a two-way rating. Okay, and that was going to be one of my questions for you, uh, but the quality control is kind of built in uh, for that because if you don't show up for work, if you do a poor job, you've got a bad attitude, whatever that may be, you're going to get basically flagged on the app. It's going to make it difficult for you to get jobs in the future. Yeah, it'll be, I mean, it's basically a peer review um, and that, you know, hopefully people 
take that into into their thoughts of how they're going to go out and you know potentially make some side mm-hmm. money off their own operation. So I don't know. Did you happen to listen to my episode last Friday with Ben Reichard, the young man who had traveled around the world working in, on farms and in ag? Yes. Actually, I listened to it yesterday while I was feeding cattle. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was listening to it, and then my mind started turning. I was like, you know, <laughs> this would be somebody I need to talk to about even another avenue for uh-huh. ag butler. And so, yes, I listened to it and I, I wrote notes down to p- potentially get in contact with him. Oh, see, great minds thinking like that's uh, my producer, Elliot, slipped me a note and was like, you got to ask him about Ben and see if there's a possibility here. So, yeah, because it's essentially you've got you've developed technology here that after listening to Ben, you could go worldwide with this. Yes. And if Jamie was sitting here with me she'd probably roll her eyes and she's gonna <laughs> roll her eyes when she hears this but i mean that would be the goal because um it's not just u.s agriculture that has this labor gap right it's, it's everywhere and uh, we were able to go to ireland and see some uh dairy cattle operations and they had the same issue and a lot of eastern europeans come to uh the uk to you know facilitate part-time labor in their peak season and so if we can make the right connections and get in the right circles it would it'd be great to be able to provide this service not just in the u.s but other areas of um, agriculture industries that need to facilitate these labor gaps yeah you know it's exciting to think about uh that you're not just matching up somebody who lives in Joplin, Missouri with somebody who needs help in Joplin, Missouri, but it could be somebody who lives in Joplin, Missouri getting matched up with somebody who needs help in Dublin, Ireland or something like that. It, it's a really interesting possibility. Yeah, we have some friends in the industry. I, I know Ben mentioned uh, some uh, some South Africa. They had some friends and we have a lot of acquaintances that have people come over during harvest mm-hmm. and run a equipment from South Africa. And, you know, I can just see that where those groups just utilize word of mouth, whereas they have this platform set up whenever they're here. And if they have some gaps in between their existing work, they can uh, fill those holes. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I want to ask you about this because I think the most daunting thing, uh, I think people have concepts like this, but the most daunting thing is getting that through that technology piece of it. So did you know? when you first came up with this concept that there was a company you could go to that would develop this for you, or were you of the mindset of, I'm going to have to figure out how to get this done? Well, early on, um, we got connected with national center for beef and they had utilized this group before on some other, um, some other programming, um, platforms that they were utilizing. And so we kind of already had a route to go, but we also needed to figure out once we mapped it out, what would be the generalization estimation of getting it built. So then we could go to work on trying to fundraise or find the funds okay. uh, to get it built out. Okay. So you knew kind of at the outset that there was, there were organizations or businesses like this that could get this done. Yes. And that it also helped too that I just binge listen to a bunch of <laughs> uh, entrepreneurial podcasts, like how, how I built this and start up and knowing, knowing some avenues to go through to figure out where we needed to get to, to get some uh, capital to get it going. Okay. So you started out uh, working and while you're still working, you're still as the regional sales manager what where does the entrepreneurship part come in for you? Has this always been there, or is this something that's developed over time? I mean, where is this coming from? I think it just is. That's the uh, ag spirit. Everybody kind of has to be an entrepreneur, okay. especially if. Um, I mean, we've been raising Charlie cattle since the late '80s, and so always trying to find uh, a new bull customer. Or as I was coming up through high school and college. Um, you know, finding those additional funds to facilitate 
being in school. So mm-hmm. I'd go around and flip. Uh, and then I, then I also was able to be a certified ultrasound tech on carcass data. And so I set up my own uh, ultrasounding business and ran all over the place. And then after that, then um, worked with DV auction and ran around the country videoing cattle for uh, on, on online sales. Mm-hmm. And so it's always kind of been one of those deals to where, um, and also being a banker's son, you always have to make sure you keep the banker happy. So <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can pay those notes off whenever, whenever you get that. So okay. always have tried to find multiple avenues to, to be able to have income coming in and not just focus on one stream of uh, income. So as you look forward then, do you, do you see a time when you're a full-time entrepreneur or do you always see this as a side hustle? Um, I would like to transition this into a full time. Um, once we, once the demand increases enough, I talking with other people in the startup industry, um, you kind of have to not only jump, jump off starting the business, but you also have to jump off going full time yeah. and putting you know, all the effort in. And so that's, that's the goal of doing that. And then also continuing the, um, the cattle operations. Awesome. So hopefully it would switch to where this is the full time and the cattle operations would technically be the side hustle, I guess. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how that happens. You know, I started my first business because I was looking to transition and, and finding a way to being a full-time farmer. And then I transitioned from that business into podcasting. And now I like podcasting so much. Even if I even if I got to the point I could be a full-time farmer, I don't think I would. I think I'd probably continue podcasting. So it's funny how uh, you can get your fire lit by some of these business ideas. Yeah, and it's it, it's interesting. Once we kind of got into the whole new ring of the ag tech world, I mean, I'm going to be honest. I thought kind of knew what was going on. Then you walk into that, and that's a whole another world. Hmm. Uh, and there's so much going on, and there's so many people that want to try to help fund a lot of these projects because they they see the need and the value in agriculture moving forward. And so um, I guess, thankfully, I kind of picked one of those lanes that not very many people are Mm -hmm. diving into. And we were a handful of the first ones that are trying to be a solution for the labor gap. And so um, there might be some other competitors coming up from behind, um, trying to develop their own different way. But um, I guess I'm kind of glad that went this route because I have the most, not just most experience, but most hands-on experience of knowing both sides of mm-hmm. uh, the pitfalls of the old, the old way of doing it, looking through your phone and trying to remember yeah. who was that one guy that helped us yeah. at XYZ show. He was pretty good. Does anybody have his number type of thing? Sure. Well, that's good. That's right where you want to be. Well, this has been great, Kevin. How can people find you? They want to know more about Ag Butler. Well, they can uh, follow us on all of our social media channels um, uh, with the handle at Ag Butler app, and that's two Ps. And then also uh, check us out on our website, agbutlerapp.org. Um, they can find all the information there, and you can download the app through ios and android or like i said um sign on through the web web desktop version awesome well this has been great thank you so much for coming on and sharing this with us today and thanks to jamie too for uh recommending you come on the show and man best of luck to you both i i love the idea of the business i think it's going to go places i appreciate the time for letting us come on and uh enjoy listening to this show matt Well, thank you very much to Kevin Johansson for coming on the show and sharing that great information with us today. And hey, we encourage you all to go out and check out Ag Butler. Hey, and also we encourage you to click that subscribe button and be a subscriber on our YouTube channel here. We would love to have you as a subscriber and connect with us on our Facebook and Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn pages as well, everybody, all under the title Off Farm Income. 
And as always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.